we're going to talk about Dante, Florence's maybe most famous son. Uh, we're going back in time to the 13th and 14th centuries. I entitled my uh, presentation, Dante, the Poet of Love. Dante is a poet for whom love is a substance that literally holds the universe together, as we'll explore. But I, I am humbled by the task of just giving you an introduction to the Divine Comedy and say it's a subject that's so vast. My hope is it just to just give you a taste of the Divine Comedy that will entice you, hopefully not to get stuck in hell. The journey involves getting through hell, but my hope is that you won't get stuck there. <laughs> but that uh, I might entice you to read the poem so that you can end up like Dante in heaven. It's a story literally about a journey of a pilgrim who goes to hell and back. Now, some of you have asked, you know, why Dante? Why have I become so enamored with Dante? And there, there are many reasons, but one of them has to do with the fact that he is indeed the poet of love. Here's what I want to ask you to do. Think about the time when you first fell in love, and it might have been a moment. It might not have been a years-long relationship. It might have been a moment. Just think about that. So for me, it was Rita Stone, the fall of 1978, there were, there's a smell of uh, leaves turning and decaying and riding a tandem bicycle. And there's also the, the, the woman in, in India I met one day, and I still think about her. So if you understand that feeling that engages your heart and your viscera and your loins, frankly, too, if you understand that feeling, you understand the impulse that impelled Dante in his spiritual journey, in his poetic journey, in his life. It's about falling in love. Dante fell in love with a young woman, a girl actually, when he was nine years old, named Beatrice Portinari. Saw her across a courtyard. And it was this moment at nine years old that literally rocked his world and impelled him on his journey. He met her again at 18. He talked to her once. Um, but imagine that our romantic feelings for another human being might have everything to do with our journey toward God. Our desire is what Dante is trying to write about. And the difference of between our desire uh, that is the highest kind of desire, which I was speaking of in the sermon, and the kind that's lust, the kind that's self-seeking. That's part of the meditation here. Um, this is a graphic that I took from a video game. This is from a graphic of a video game called Dante's Inferno. They put a lot of money into this video game. And, you know, Beatrice is kind of sexy. She's really ex really good looking. And that's only part of it, the erotic. But uh, we need to also keep in mind, this is Salvador Dali's uh, rendition of Beatrice comforting Dante. You should keep in mind, though, that Beatrice is a Christ figure in the poem, uh, a feminine Christ figure. Actually, she is the one who, uh, through a, a sort of courtly chain of people, including St. Lucy, goes and intercedes for Dante at the beginning of the journey when he gets lost. So it's about love. It's about falling in love. And that's one of the reasons why I was fascinated by this poem. But if you read the poem, you'll discover that Dante is a really smart dude. Uh, you will get an education. Uh, he was a Renaissance man before there was a Renaissance. A poet, uh, in some ways a scientist, a politician. So if you read Dante, you'll get a primer in theology and philosophy and the ideas of the day, especially St. Thomas Aquinas. St. So Thomas Aquinas' is theology is set to poetry. He's very much indebted to him. You'll get an education in classical literature and ancient Greek and Roman mythology, which forms the backdrop of a lot of the divine comedy. You'll get a whole lesson in uh, medieval history, especially the internecine political machinations of the people in Florence during the 13th and 14th century. It's very interesting to see what figures from Dante's own time he puts in his story. You'll get, of course, if you read the Divine Comedy, a really excellent experience of some very subtle and some very beautiful poetry. Uh, Dante, as I said, is really a Renaissance man who knows so much about so many subjects and sets them to poetry in a way that is so subtle and so beautiful. I, I can only give you some basic ideas that will hopefully give you some background that'll be helpful if you decide to read the comedy. And if you do, uh, I'm going to talk about Virgil in a moment, but if you do, I would hope that you have some kind of guide because if you've ever read the Divine Comedy, it's a pretty hard surface to penetrate for modern readers. But if you are uh, diligent in getting beyond the surface, I think you'll be rewarded with something very beautiful. So some basic things about the poem. It begins on Good Friday in the year 1300. 
so the beginning of the 14th century. Uh, Dante is the main character of the poem, so we call that character the pilgrim, Dante the pilgrim. And so here is uh, Blake, William Blake's rendition of Dante the pilgrim at the very beginning. Uh, gets lost in the woods, I'll say something about that in a moment. Sees the mountain of purgatory, wants to shortcut the journey, but these three beasts chase him back down into hell where he must go in order to get to heaven. Uh, so it's about Dante the Pilgrim in 1300, but Dante's writing over a decade later, somewhere around 1310-ish, and this gives him the ability, uh, since the narrative's taking place in 1300, to tell the future. As Dante the Pilgrim's living in 1300, Dante the writer knows what's going to happen next. So this is a literary uh, conceit that, that the, the poem is based on. You can't understand the Divine Comedy also unless you understand the fact that Dante was exiled in 1301. This was one of the most painful moments in his life. He was uh, on a papal delegation to Rome. The arch villain of the, of the Divine Comedy, Boniface VIII, tricked him, caused him to be uh, exiled from the city of Florence. And this was a huge tragedy. He was a leading citizen of Florence. He, they had a rotating mayorship, and he was the mayor for a time. He was involved in the complicated uh, politics between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, and um, through uh, Boniface's trickery, he was exiled from the city of Florence. But lucky for us, it caused him to really take stock of his life. Why am I writing poetry? Am I just going to write lovely love poems that are about courtly love, and which we could talk a long time about? Love songs like the troubadours used to strum about their love, the knights uh, going and fighting battles for ladies in waiting. Is that all my poetry is about, or is it about something more? Is it about the ultimate love, which is the love of God? So lucky for us, because of exile and the pain of that, Dante writes the Divine Comedy. It uh, starts with a guy who has a middle-age crisis, gets lost in some dark woods. I, I don't think that we have to say anything more about that metaphor, do we, for any of us? It's a poem about midlife, but it says in the beginning of our, in the middle of our life. So it's really about Dante the Pilgrim that speaks to a universal theme for all of us. So here is uh, Gustave Doré's uh, etching of Dante getting lost in the dark wood. Uh, you need to know, though, that uh, he, he, through the intercession of Beatrice and uh, St. Lucy, he sent a guide, uh, Virgil, the great Roman poet who wrote the Aeneid. If you can read the Aeneid, that great poem, it's a wonderful, helpful backdrop to reading the Divine Comedy. So there's Doré's etching of uh, Dante and Virgil. Many scholars think that Virgil represents human reason. Uh, Virgil doesn't get to heaven. He's, he's in limbo with the rest of the virtuous pagans. It's one of the great themes that Dante struggles with. Why is that? How is it this incredible virtuous person doesn't get to heaven? He didn't have the grace of Christ. Uh, and so Virgil can only take Dante to the top of purgatory, after which Beatrice is his guide. But it's Virgil who, goes, uh, who guides him most of the way. So Divine Comedy, most people think it's just Dante's Inferno. Actually, there are three cantices, three canticles. First one is Hell. I love this graphic. It was from that video game again. We mostly think of hell as uh, fire, but it's not all fire, as we'll speak of in a moment. So this is what Dante encounters. The way to heaven is through hell. The way up is the way down. You can't shortcut that journey. You can't go right to the top of purgatory. Uh, and let's talk about a little, a little bit about hell. Each of these three canticles have nine sections. So uh, hell has nine terraces or levels. Purgatory has nine levels. Heaven has nine realms, spheres. Uh, and I want to say a little bit about hell. It's, it's the most read poem because it's the most interesting because there's all kinds of fun stuff that happens and, uh, you know, salacious things that we, we read about. Dante categorizes sin. Uh, according to one's sin, there will they be in hell. And there are gradations of sin. There are worse sins than others. So interestingly, you see here the lustful, the, the topmost ring of hell. What does the church spend most of, it, most of its time talking about? But sexual sins. Uh, and so the, the top levels uh, correspond to what we call sins of incontinence, sins of passion. So for example, in the, um, uh, in the, um, one of the uh, 
upper rings we have the uh, the the, ab the prodigal and the lustful. There's a famous story of uh, Paolo and Francesca uh, who were there for lust, and uh, Paolo and Francesca fall in love because they read a book of King Arthur, this uh, medieval romance, and they blame it on the book. We were reading the book, and all of a sudden we fell into bed. And then uh, Francesca's uh, husband uh, comes and slaughters them both. And the punishment, the contrapasso for the people in this place is to be blown about by these fierce winds. It's what lust does to people. Uh, the interesting thing is Francesca's and Paolo's contrapasso, their punishment, is to be together forever. The top three uh, rings are for sins of incontinence or um, of weakness. Uh, the, the, the next three are for sins of violence against oneself, against others, against God. And the bottommost part of hell are sins of treachery and fraud. So those sins that are most uh, destructive to human community are the furthest down in hell. I'll say a little more about that in a moment. Purgatory is a mountain. Interesting that hell is created when Satan falls to earth and creates a hole for himself the bottom of which is ice. I'll say a little bit th about that in a moment. And by falling to earth, he creates a mountain on the other side, which is the mountain of purgatory. Um, and that has nine levels as well. And of course, heaven uh, has nine spheres. And Dante the Pilgrim uh, proceeds through each of these three realms that correspond to the three canticles. At the top of heaven is the imperium, the white rose that uh, is consists not of organic petals, but of saints, of angels, angelic beings. And what do they do at the top of heaven? They sing. They sing to each other. So a little bit more basic information about the poem. It's over 14,000 lines, 33 cantos each, chapters, uh, except for Inferno. So you might say the first chapter is an introduction. Uh, Inferno is not quite in line with the other ones because it's hell, you know, it's asymmetrical. So it has 34. 33 times 3 is 99. That's not quite the perfect number. 100 is perfect, so it's 33, 33, and 34. Dante creates a, a rhyme scheme especially for this poem called Terza Rima. And we're going to check out Terza Rima a little bit and what, what that's about. It's a three-line interlocking scheme that basically uh, goes A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C. So you'll notice here that Vida rhymes with Smarita, A and A, Oscura and Dura, B and B, Forte and Morte. So A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C. And C. So I thought it'd be kind of fun and to listen to what it sounds like. So you get a sense of how Terza Rima works and the beautiful, la the beauty of the language. Uh, this is Canto One, uh, the very beginning of the poem, uh, midway in our journey of life. And this is the Longfellow translation. I believe, Jake, correct me if I'm long wrong, that Longfellow was certainly the first American to translate the, lo the Divine Comedy into English, but is he the first English speaker to translate it into English? Okay. <laughs> Well, I believe Longfellow was the first uh, English speaker to translate Dante into the English language. This is his translation. Midway in, in the journey of our life, I came to myself in the dark wood. And I want to just pause here. Because even the first few lines, we have a sense of the subtlety of Dante's language and his use of, uh, of paradox and, 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 and metaphor. So one of the commentators that I uh, listened to when I first encountered the Divine Comedy, Gil Bailey, who had a, has a, a beautiful commentary on the whole poem, would translate these first few lines uh, by saying, I found myself lost 
So you get a sense of the subtlety of that, right? I found myself in the most, uh, the top level is the literal level. I found myself in a situation that was being lost. But if you look at it on a spiritual and allegorical level, the idea here is I found myself in the state of being lost. You see? How do we get found? By being lost. The only way we can get found, the only way we can get to heaven, is by going through hell, is by getting lost. And so I, I, that's, more, for me, I think it's sort of an example of the subtlety with which uh, these, this poetry is written. And Dante is very careful to say you can read it on the surface level, but there's an allegorical level that you need to look for in understanding the poem. So a few theological themes, and then we're going to look at one of the cantos in a little bit of detail. Um, and hopefully it'll be a little fun for us to look at it. But some theological themes that we uh, might encounter in reading the Divine Comedy. One of the defining features of hell, it's very ironic. This is Charon, the, uh, the hell's ferryman, who is ferrying the lost souls across the Acheron River from uh, limbo into hell proper. So the ironic thing is they're crossing the Acheron is they want to go. They're eager to get there. They're cursing the day of their birth. They're cursing their parents. The irony of hell is that the people there actually want to be there. How many of you read C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce? So this is really Dante set to modern fiction. Now what is it about? But somebody who gets a bus to take people from this gray city to another place that's really heaven, and it's painful for them to be there, but most of them want to go back. Most of them want to go back home. So hell is a place where God basically gives us what we want. This is Dante's point. It's not that God is punishing us. It's God is giving us what we want. And what Dante is doing is exposing the fruit of our behavior. So as Dante goes through hell, he's seeing the flawedness of human beings and, and the traps that we can fall in. All desire leads to God, but there are any number of ways that we can get stuck in desiring the wrong thing. And so hell is a place where people have lost the good of the intellect. They've lost their sense of any conscience. They've forgotten the goodness that they experienced even in life. And so they're sunk so far they can't even conceive of the good. It's a place where they're experiencing what, what uh, Dante calls their contrapasso, their counterpassion, which is exposing really the fruit of one's action in hell. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, this is uh, Bishop Ruggieri and Count Ugolino at the bottom of hell. It's my favorite canto in the Divine Comedy. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful pieces of literature I think ever written. But this, these are people at the very bottom of hell who are guilty of the sin of fraud, of treachery. And Brugieri tricks Ugolino, captures him, locks him up in a tower, and starves him to death. And there's so much subtlety of language and irony. He's locked in the tower with his sons. And he's so hungry, he's gnawing at his hands. And his children think that he's so hungry, uh, but he's really worried. Uh, and later becomes so hungry. Um, that his sons offer themselves as food. And it's unclear what it says in, in the canto, but there's some who believe that he literally ate his sons in his degradation. So this is a complete parody of the sacrament, of the Eucharist. Somebody giving themselves as food for another is taken literally. And what could have landed uh, Ugolino in heaven repentance and acceptance of grace at the end of his life is what, en is what lands him in hell. And his punishment is to forever explore his hatred of Ruggieri by gnawing his skull. They're frozen in the ice, and he's gnawing and eating, literally eating the skull of the one he hates. So here's another rendition of that. I believe this is Salvador Dali's rendition of Ugolino and Ruggieri. It's a place, hell, I'm spending more time there because it's a lot more interesting, but if you read the Divine Comedy, it's filled with monsters that are really interesting, but they represent the disorder of life that human beings can often fall prey to. And it really is an exploration of this idea from Augustine that sin is the perversion of our primary desire to love. So we see that in living colors. Here's uh, Cerberus, the three-headed dog, who is the ring where the gluttons are being punished. And Virgil, the, you know, he's barking at them and threatening to eat them. And Virgil pacifies him by throwing dirt in his mouth, and he gobbles it up. This is Salvador Dali's rendition of Cerberus, the three-headed dog. 
in hell, there is no moral progress. There's no progress at all. Nobody's moving anywhere. Um, it's always night. It's a place where there is indeed fire, but unlike Pentecost, uh, the fire only creates pain. It doesn't create any kind of conversion. What is the fire, in, especially the fire that we see at Pentecost, what's its purpose? If you own a grill, you know that the purpose of fire is to purify, to burn away. But in hell, the only purpose of fire is to inflict pain. And so suffering is meaningless. That is a hallmark of hell. In, at the bottom of hell, it's interesting, I think, Satan is not a scary figure. He's a comic figure. He's a ridiculous figure. So he created this by falling from heaven and disobeying God and falls in his own hole. And it's frozen at the bottom of hell. We think, what would be the best way to describe hell? Certainly fire exists further up. The very bottom of hell is frozen. It's a state of complete deadness. And Satan is stuck in it. And it's cold because he's flapping his wings. He's trying to create his own wind. He's trying, it's a parody of what it means when we seek to be self-powered. So it's really a parody of the Trinity. He's got three heads. It's a parody of the Holy Spirit because he's flapping his wings, trying to create his own wind. And it's a parody of communion. He's eating the three worst sinners in hell, which are uh, Cassius and Brutus, the two who plotted against Julius Caesar, and uh, Judas. So that's a, a parody of communion because he's literally eating these sinners for all eternity. An interesting little fact, too. How does Dante get out of hell? I, I don't know. I love this. But the, the other famous canto is back in the middle. It's called the most comic canto. It's when the demons are playing around and one of the demons uh, farts and blows a trumpet with his butt. That's, <laughs> that's my second most favorite. But they get, they, get to, they get to purgatory. Anybody know how, they get, how the, uh, Dante and Virgil get to purgatory? So I don't have to say it? Through his butt crack. I'm not kidding, folks. So, you know, what's hell? It's a ridiculous place. It's not a place that, you know, we should get all, it, it, it's, it's a really, I wouldn't say comedic, but it's a, it's a parody of what the divine life is. Um, purgatory, we're just going to say a little bit about that. What differentiates that from hell? There's pain and suffering, but the primary difference between hell and purgatory in the poem is that in purgatory, suffering is meaningful. Suffering is purposeful. It's a means by which to purify one's soul and essentially... Everybody who's in purgatory is in heaven. It's a, just a matter of time. The grace is actually in the process by which one becomes sanctified and ready for heaven. Every time a soul enters heaven, a bell rings. So you remember, it's a wonderful life. Isn't that what happens there? This is uh, the mountain purgatory, and people are actually moving. There's day and there's night. It corresponds to our own life. Much of the comedy corresponds to the movement from slavery, uh, from the time of wandering, and the promised land, which correspond to hell, purgatory, and paradiso. Purgatory is where Dante the pilgrim masters himself. And so the famous line is Virgil telling Dante, I crown and mighty thee, Lord of thyself, as he purifies himself through this journey, through purgatory. And heaven is the place where there are also degrees of blessedness. When I was talking about there are degrees of sin in, the, in hell. Some people are more blessed than others in heaven, according to Dante's scheme here. But the interesting thing is, everybody is cool with it. I'm okay where I am. I know you're more blessed than me, but the difference is, that's a joy that you're above me. And I'm happy, I'm satisfied where I am. So nobody's complaining about where they are. This is Salvador Dali's uh, The Joy of the Blessed. He uh, illustrated the Divine Comedy. I guess the Italian government pulled the funding because they didn't want a Spaniard illustrating the Divine <laughs> Comedy, but <laughs> Dali went ahead anyway and, and uh, did the paintings. So we're going to go back to uh, the baptistry of San Giovanni, where we uh, spent a little bit of time last week, because this plays a part in Divine Comedy. I said that this was a structure that's very old, certainly was around in the time of Dante, one of the most important structures in Florence. And we're going to explore a little bit Canto 19, which is all about the sin of simony. Um, I'm wondering if you say simony as well. I, I should have gotten Google 
to tell me the proper translation, but it's where the Simoniacs are being punished. Now, what is simony? It's trading on the sacred. And we'll see in a moment the, the worst sinner who's guilty of simony is none other than Boniface VIII, who is the one responsible for Dante being exiled. What people were doing was they were selling divine offices for cash because the church has probably the most powerful institution of the Middle Ages. Uh, so this is basically treating the sacred in a way that is opposite to its purpose. Uh, it's making a mockery of the sacred. So I can buy this. It's based on Simon Magus in, uh, in uh, the Simon the Magician in Acts 8 who saw Peter healing somebody and he's like, how can I get some of that? How much do you want for it? This is a, a sin that is corrosive of the very purpose of the church. It's an upside down treatment of what are the pr sacred purposes of, of the church. So how are the sinners being punished in Canto 19? First one is Nicholas III, who was the Pope reigning at, in 1300, where that story is taking place. They're plugged up in holes that look like the, the baptismal font that Dante saw in the baptistry of San Giovanni. So we see that they're upside down. Their feet are being burned by this oily fire, the oil that corresponds to a parody of the unction, the sacrament of the church. The, the irony here is that they're plugging up a portal which is really meant to lead people into heaven. This is a kind of fun rendition of Canto 19. I hope you will enjoy it. It's only about two minutes. And that's another modern artist's rendition of uh, what's going on in Canto 19. Let's read, actually, the lines that are toward the beginning of Canto 19. Along the sides and bottom of this level of hell, I could see the livid stone was pierced with holes, all round and of a single size. They seemed to me as wide and deep as those in my beautiful St. John, the baptistry of San Giovanni, made for the priests to baptize in one of which, not many years ago, I broke to save one nearly drowned in it, and let this be my seal to undeceive all men. Now what is Dante doing there? Here's what the baptismal font would have looked like. And what Dante's doing is he, he has a story in his background. People were trashing him. They said the dude desecrated a holy place. He busted a baptismal font, and people were ruining his reputation because of this this rumor. So what Dante is doing is saying, uh, I'm going to set the record straight. That's not what happened. Why did I bust? Why did I destroy a sacred thing? Desecrate it? Because somebody was drowning. There was a little boy that was drowning in this baptismal font. So what's he saying there? First, he's clearing his name. He's saying, this is what really happened. But he's saying, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to bust something that seems sacred in order to do what? To save life. So what's he about to do? He's about to put a pope in a hole. Right. <laughs> and by the way, the, the, the biggest population in hell, can you guess? <laughs> Clergy. <laughs> Clergy. I'm not kidding. Cardinals, popes. So here's a, the current pope who's stuck upside down because this is an inversion 
of the sacred purpose of their office. They're inverted in this hole, and they're clogging up the portal that allows people to heaven, the baptismal font, which is the doorway that uh, leads people to heaven, over which the clergy uh, have charge, um, have uh, the responsibility of baptizing others. We could go on and on with the kind of subtlety and, and the, the allegorical significance of so many and the beauty of the language of the Divine Comedy. But I wanted to give you a taste. I should have put a picture of heaven there too to balance that out. My hope is that that might entice you to actually read the poem and study it. It's, it's hard going if you just pick up and read before bed because you're like, what's going on here? By the way, I want to commend to you a blog that a number of us put together. Um, Bob Sinner was one of the bloggers. It, the idea came about several years ago when I didn't, I didn't have a uh, Lenten discipline, and I thought, wouldn't it be fun to blog the Divine Comedy, and I'll just read a canto a day, and I'll write something about it. And <laughs> I often bite off more than I can chew, and I did realize that that was too much for me to do. So but I thought, you know, what if I got a bunch of friends who like literature to do that with me? And so six of us set out on that journey, and we blogged a canto a day four years ago, and we started in Inferno. Jake Willard Christ uh, was one of the bloggers, the motley band of bloggers, and Gordon McCoskey, uh, Adrian Perry, uh, Pierre Koistra at the Lawrenceville School, John Tim Payne, who's known to many of us, a writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer, all of us have covered almost every canto now of the Divine Comedy over three years. Check that out. It's actually, if you're going to read it, it's a kind of fun way to, uh, to get a commentary of each canto. But Dante is the poet of love, and reading him, uh, hopefully you might discover something about what he's talking about. Uh, he sees that love, again, is the power that holds the universe together. These are the final lines of the Divine Comedy. Uh, and here my exalted vision lost its power. I have no more means to tell you what is essentially ineffable and beyond words, but now my will and my desire, like wheels revolving with an even motion, were turning with the love that moves the sun and all the other stars. So I hope I've given to you a sense of some of my enthusiasm for this poem, and I hope that might entice you to look further. So thanks for listening. Now, uh, we have a, a little bit of time for questions, maybe five minutes. Any questions? Was Dante the, the first to uh, was Dante the first to suggest that there was clergy who populated hell? Um, I, I want to begin by the disclaimer that I'm not an expert on Dante, but I would imagine that it kicked up some dust, this poem. And here's Dante putting his enemies in hell. So I would say it's pretty unprecedented. You know, that literary method was used to put his enemies. Dante called it was the comedy. People recognized later that there was something sacred about this poem, so then they started calling it the divine comedy. But I would say no, I don't think it's pretty unprecedented that such a thing. It wasn't like people were writing their version of hell all the time, as far as I know. Exactly that. Isn't this Catholic? Well, I would say a hearty yes to that. This is happening before the Reformation. Yes. So it's good that you bring that point up because Dante, in some sense, is like a pre-Reformation reformer, I would say. I so what he's doing is saying, this stinks. Yeah. Pope selling <laughs> divine offices. You can be Bishop of Luxembourg. The price for that is, you know, $35,000, you know. Those were the good old days. No, just... Yeah, well, Dante really, I think, has a handle on sacred responsibility that leaders in the church have, the abuses that were happening in, in a very subtle way. So I would say he's kind of a reformer before the Reformation. Nancy. Nancy was one of our bloggers. How could I have left you out? What is the name of the blog? It's called Daily Dante. Yeah, and the really interesting thing about that, um, <laughs> one of the highlights of that year was uh, we were reading Robert Pinsky's version of Inferno and Robert Pinsky was Poet Laureate uh, for a time. And <clears throat> uh, Jake was asking a question about how Robert Pinsky would translate this particular word. <laughs> and who chimes in but Robert Pinsky? <laughs> and he answers the question you <laughs> on the blog. The, the number of hits like spiked after that. <laughs> uh, but this is a, now a static blog. There's no new content, but we get an average of 60 hits a day from all over the world on this blog. So it's really kind of neat. I should sell advertising, right? I should just commit my own form of simony, right? Yeah. 
Other questions. Are there influences on his life that made him such a radical? Well, I would say the primary one was his exile. And I'm glad you asked that question because I didn't spend much time about the political situation in Florence, which is super complicated. And Dante was sucked into it. You know, he was a white Guelph. He thought that uh, we can... <laughs> I could make a political comment. I won't. He thought politics are our savior and we can make it work. Uh, he actually happened to think that the Roman Empire was the best thing going for organizing human community. It's like the UN. Let's have one great power that's going to uh, help organize us. But the thing that radicalized him was being exiled and disillusioned about politics. And so w at one point he says, I'm a party of one. You know, my ruler is God. And we have to be very careful about temporal rulers. He has a lot of faith in some of them, thinking that they're going to help bring in a more peaceful realm. King Henry didn't work out. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that his exile was what radicalized him and gave us a divine comedy. How long was the divine comedy originally? That's an interesting question, but I think, see, Dante wrote very consciously in the vernacular. He didn't write in Latin which was a radical move, because if you want to be highfalutin, if you want to appeal to the intelligentsia, you would have written in Latin. So it could have been read by the average person. I, I don't know how many people actually, you know, peasants and stuff, wrote, read the Divine Comedy, but it was pretty salacious reading for most people, though. It was accessible for more people than if it had been written in Latin. It wouldn't be available to the peasantry, but... Wouldn't you like to read about people who are contemporaries? Like, here's Richard Nixon, and what punishment does he get? You know what I mean? Like, who would you put where? It's an interesting exercise you might try. What's most interesting is what their punishment is. Yep. You know? Thank you.